Good morning. I'm Benjamin Gadan, director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program. Welcome to today's dialogue from our very own Lithium Triangle Initiative, Latin America's Lithium, Critical Minerals, and the Global Energy Transition. It is no exaggeration to say that the future of the global energy transition depends upon decisions being made right now in three South American countries, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. That is because more than half of the world's lithium is found in those three nations. And without abundant, affordable lithium for batteries, the widespread adoption of electric vehicles will be impossible. The U.S. government has recognized lithium as a so-called critical mineral for renewable energy technologies. Large batteries are required not only for electric cars and trucks, but also to store energy from renewable sources, such as the sun and the wind, and to permit a transition from the fossil fuels that are warning this planet. Large batteries require large quantities of lithium. The United States is not the only country that has recognized the importance of Latin America's lithium resources. China, for example, is a major investor in lithium found in the salt flats of Northwest Argentina. China also dominates the global battery business, not coincidentally, and it gets much of the lithium for its battery factories from South America. In December, the European Union renegotiated its trade agreement with Chile, in part to improve access to the lithium in Chile's Atacama Desert. In January, the next month, the German Chancellor visited Chile to discuss ways to improve German access to Chile's lithium-rich brine. However, even as global demand for lithium explodes, Latin America is still experimenting with dramatically divergent strategies to manage this increasingly strategic sector. Just a few days ago, for example, Chile, one of the world's top lithium producers, announced bold new rules for lithium extraction, as well as the creation of a state-owned enterprise to produce lithium. For its part, Bolivia is still struggling to get its lithium industry off the ground, despite enormous reserves. All of the region's lithium producers are working hard to balance economic objectives with environmental considerations, including water use, and impacts on local communities. Also unsettled is the best role for the government and strategies to encourage downstream industries, such as battery and electric vehicle manufacturing that now largely do not take place in the region where lithium is produced and refined. To address these complex policy debates and to examine the role of international actors, including Europe, the United States, and China, the Wilson Center established this Lithium Triangle Initiative now more than three years ago. Today, in a milestone, our Lithium Triangle Initiative is launching its first flagship report, providing insights and data on this regionally and globally consequential industry. The very first flagship report is available now on our website, wilsoncenter.org forward slash LAP for Latin America program. It is also available on this very event page, so scroll down and you will find it there. Our first flagship report looks at how U.S.-China competition is reflected in the scramble for lithium in South America, how opposition to lithium mining in some local communities could curtail production at a time of peaking global demand, and how to improve regulations regarding water use to ensure a sustainable lithium industry in the region and to protect vulnerable ecosystems in the process. I am delighted that the authors and editor of our first flagship report are joining us this morning. Welcome. I'm also delighted that you are joining us, and I appreciate your interest in this emerging and absolutely critical subject in the Americas and for the United States and other friends of the region and friends of the planet. Our editor of our flagship report is today's moderator. She is Wilson Center Global Fellow, Patricia Vasquez, a friend and author of several reports that we have produced on the region's lithium industry and a former visitor to the salt flats in both Argentina and Chile's Atacama Desert. We hope we'll hear more about her travels and the insights she has gained from that research. Patricia, thank you so much for all your support for the Lithium Triangle Initiative at the Wilson Center. I'm going to turn the conversation over to you to introduce our authors and experts. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Benjamin. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, we will have a, a conversation with an outstanding group of experts who produce the insightful essays of our first flash, flagship lithium report. 
Again, my name is Patricia Vázquez, and I'm a Global Fellow at the Wilson Center, and I'm delighted to be here. Latin America is at the center of the transition away from fossil fuels. Lithium is the key component to enable that transition. The countries known as the Lithium Triangle concentrate almost 60% of the world's lithium resources. Chile is the second largest producer in the world and holds the world's largest reserves. Argentina is the third largest producer and has dozens of new lithium projects in the pipeline. And in the case of Bolivia, it is still not producing, but it holds the world's largest lithium resources that have yet to be certified. Beyond the lithium triangle, Brazil is about to start first lithium production from heart rock, and Peru and Mexico are also in the early stages of development of the lithium industry. For now, the lithium-rich brines of Chile and Argentina's Andes offer the most promising immediate global supply option in response to projected demand increase in coming years. Today, we will explore some of the opportunities and the challenges of Latin America's lithium industry with a particular look at Chile and Argentina. Allow me to introduce our panel in alphabetical order. Ana Elizabeth Bastida is a senior lecturer in law at the School of Humanities, School of Social Sciences and Law of the University of Dundee. John Graham is a professor at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs of Indiana University. John Rubb is a clinical associate professor at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs of Indiana University. And Henry Sanderson is executive editor for Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Again, thank you all for being here today. A few quick logistics before we start. The discussion will last for 60 minutes. I will allow each of you to talk. Uh, I will ask a question. I will allow you to talk for about two minutes. We will try to make it as conversational as possible. So uh, if anyone wants to ask something or make an, a comment after that answer, please feel free to do it. We will be taking questions from the audience via the events website. Once the conversation goes live, a chat box will open there and the audience will be able to submit questions. So let's jump right into the discussion. And my first question goes to Henry. I was wondering if you could give us an overview of the lithium supply and demand market in coming years and how you foresee the contribution of Latin American producing countries. And while you do that, if you could briefly Give us your thoughts about this idea of creating an OPEC of lithium producing countries that was brought up by Mexico and Bolivia. So the floor is yours. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, thank you very much, uh, Patricia, for the introduction. Um, just to set the scene, um, at the moment, Chile is the second largest producer of, of lithium after, um, after Australia. Um, most, of the, most of our lithium um, goes, goes to China. Um, it's actually lost market share to, to Australia. Um, but going forward um, this decade, um, you know, we expect you know, so Chile to go from 24% um, of, of the global market to, uh, to actually to fall to 15% um, by 2028 um, and the end of the decade. And that's really because we haven't seen new projects um, in Chile. We haven't seen um, new investments. Whereas Argentina is, is the opposite story where we've seen lots of new investment, lots of new projects. Um, so we see, um, you know, Argentina's productions really, um, you know, is gonna go from around 35,000 tons um, LCE to over 500,000 tons by the end of the decade. So that's a really, really um, huge, huge growth. And it's gonna overtake Argentina as the biggest producer um, in Latin America. Uh, but at the same time, as you said, we see new producers, um, Sigma Lithium in Brazil, uh, starting production um, this year, um, AMG uh, Lithium also expanding in Brazil. So we see new, uh, new countries um, coming, coming to the market. Um, but you mentioned um, the OPEC. Um, you know, I personally think that would be be hard to achieve. But but other countries like Indonesia, big nickel producer, has has floated um, this idea of of controlling controlling prices um, as well. Um, but I do think um, 
you know, for Latin America, we've yet to see Bolivia really be, um, a, a, you know, be a producer really at all um, to have any sway to have a to have a sort of OPEC um, OPEC like um, system. And also, as I say, Australia is going to maintain its position as the biggest uh, lithium producer this decade. So it would be hard to completely um, control world, world supply. Um, it's not like Indonesia and nickel, where Indonesia is going to be, um, you know, the biggest sole producer of nickel this decade. So they do have a lot of lot more leverage than I think um, uh, Latin America has. So, yes, that's 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 the situation. All eyes are on Chile now because while um, some media are saying it's a full nationalization, it's not really. Uh, it, it isn't really a full nationalization, and um, we have to wait to see to whether actually this will enable new projects, new partnerships between private companies and the state to really uh, see new projects uh, come out in Chile, and that could increase Chile's, uh, Chile's production. Thank you, Henry. And, and yes, the, 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 the launch of the Chilean uh, National Lith Lithium St Strategy created a, a commotion, uh, not just in Chile, but in the world. And we, we can yes. talk about it later. Yes. Um, so my next question goes to John Graham. Um, there's no question that demand for lithium is going to continue to grow in coming years. Like, um, like uh, Henry just said, it is also going to grow in Latin America. Um, this expansion, however, will come at the same time as we are seeing growing opposition to lithium mining in, in, in Argentina and Chile especially. What do you think Latin American countries could do to manage these two opposing tendencies, the increasing mining versus the opposition to it, in a way that will allow for all stakeholders in, in the region to take advantage of the economic growth potential, of the huge economic growth potential that this lithium industry is offering? The floor is yours. Well, it's a great question, Patricia. I wish I had a definitive answer to it. Uh, but let me say a few things. Um, in most markets, when there's a surge in the demand for a commodity, we believe that the supply response will, over time, close that gap and you'll get to an equilibrium. It's important that everybody realizes that the market for lithium is not a free market. In order to do, get a, a lithium mine started, you need not only the formal permits, depending on the country you're in, but you need local public acceptance of the activity because in the long run, developers cannot sustain their operations when there's an adversarial relationship between the developers uh, and, the, um, and the local community. Um, so in that regard, what we found in our paper that I did with John Rupp is we looked at some uh, examples where this effort to bring local support had had some indications of success. And, then, and we went outside lithium, not just in the, in the territory of lithium, because quite honestly, a lot of this opposition to lithium mining is similar to the opposition of mining for all commodities that are used in American industry. It is not a fundamentally more onerous process to do lithium mining than it is to mine for other materials. Two examples I'd give you is uh, for natural gas in Pennsylvania where they established impact fees that developers pay. And the money from those impact fees, it does not go to the, the United States government or the state of Pennsylvania. It goes primarily to the local communities where the lithium mining or processing is occurring. And that has generated a substantial amount of public support for, we call it fracking in the United States in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's also in Peru, my colleague John Rupp can tell us more about this later on, but there's a very promising case where you had a, a, uh, a multinational come in in the copper mining sector and work very effectively with the local community to get started on, on new activities. And we think that there are, there are lessons to be drawn there as well. So it's going to be very difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. Yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, John, for, for that comment. Um, and now um, I will go to Elizabeth. Um, and um, high, high environmental, social, and governance standards that are, that are put into practice, not just on written paper, but into practice, 
will be key to the success of the lithium industry in Latin America. Water is at the center of concerns with regards to lithium extraction from brine. And it's at the center of the opposition that John has just spoken about. Approximately 2.2 million liters of water are needed to produce one ton of brine. Chile and Argentina are the world's largest producers of lithium from brine. And I know you're not a hydrologist, but you have looked at, at this issue in depth. So I was wondering if you could walk us through what exactly we are talking about when we say that lithium extraction from brines like that produced in Chile and Argentina impacts the water balance of the salt flat. The floor is yours. I thank you for that question. Yes, the salt lakes or salaris are, are close hydrological basins that often host a fragile lake and wetland ecosystems. So they, they are, we have to bear in mind that these are one of the driest areas of the world. So they are, and they are greatly affected by climate change. So the combination of all these factors means that the inadequate management of lithium extraction from brines can affect the water balance within the basin and the surroundings. And the, the question, and, and why that happens? Uh, so the prevailing method of extraction uh, is at the moment by pumping brines to the surface and transporting them to evaporation ponds. So where lithium decants through natural factors as wind and, and solar evaporation. Um, and so this is a quite a, a low cost, uh, or relatively low cost production uh, process. However, what uh, scientists say is that uh, a brine pumping can impact the natural evaporation discharge of the salt flats and thus alter the water balance of the basin and, and can disrupt uh, the fragile, the fragile ecosystems. And there are other concerns that they raise that they relate to the loss of water uh, through evaporation and also, they raise concern about uh, the practice of reinjecting water or uh, in the salt flats. Uh, so there are other other uh, alternative technologies that are being assessed and, and tested. Uh, that they are called direct lithium extraction. That they attempt to use less water and so be being less. In Impactful on, on the salt lakes and on the water balance. So extra care must be, must be exercised in all this uh, in the extraction. Yes, thank you for that. And it's um, in, in the in the brines, my my experience was that um, there's several issues that that, like you say, uh, have to do with evaporation of the water in an area that is already a desert, plus uncertainty about uh, fresh water being contaminated. But there are some efforts being made uh, from a technology point of view um, to try to mitigate the impact of uh, lithium extraction in, in South America on water. And, and here I would go to John Rupp and, and uh, I would like to ask you about new technologies that are being developed that are supposed to be more, like I say, environmentally friendly than the evaporation ponds. They are known as direct lithium extraction, DLE, and they will, a lot of companies there that are operating there are working on developing these technologies and they are theoretically more environmentally friendly because they use less water. And I was wondering if, um, if you could tell us a little bit what these technologies are. Should we expect a magical change in uh, the production of lithium that will eventually mitigate the opposition that we see today to, to lithium extraction? The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Patricia. Yes, the idea of direct lithium extraction is an intriguing one, and certainly technological advances like that can be a, a game changer. You can you can really have some some things happen. Um, I think uh, the, the 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 point about a water balance is key. And, and that's a really nice way to think about hydrological systems is that if you're moving water, large amounts of water out of a, out of a solar and, and, and using, uh, using the either uh, uh, human-made or, or natural evaporative techniques to change that, you're, you're, one will have to take into account uh, the injection of that uh, brine back into the solar to preserve the hydrological regime. So the notion with direct lithium extraction is that, that you're using you're using mechanical devices as some kind of an engineered system to do the extraction versus the thermal power of the sun. Um, it's 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 an intriguing engineering practice. Um, it has a couple of ways of going. But let's remember, it's an energy intensive process, just like the evaporative process is a very energy intensive process. So you've got a cost, a significant cost. So uh, can these resources be indeed recoverable reserves with the economics of direct lithium extraction? That's fundamentally the question. I think there's a suite of competing technologies out there. Some of them have various kinds of chemical sorbents. Others have electrokinetic kinds of ways of, of separating elements. Uh, things that have been probably used in other industries. The notion is that to, to fit it to this industry, and it's really an economic question. The engineers work these problems so beautifully, and, and conceivably, they can come through some kind of a, 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 an economic threshold where that technology can be applied. But, but in, indeed, the question is to, to re-inject the amount of fluid that's withdrawn such to not perturb the hydrological regime, and then you're going to preserve that water balance. So maybe direct lithium extraction in the Salton Sea of California, where it's seen some significant uh, both political and economic uh, stimulus from the state of California, as well as the federal government, as well as in other parts of the world, such as the Solars and the Lithium Triangle, where it could be uh, deployed are, 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 are a positive game changer if the economics can be worked out. Thank you, John. I, I guess one thing to clarify is that these uh, technologies are still at a pilot stage. And my understanding is that they haven't been really tested commercial. There's only one operation, which is Livens in Argentina, right. uh, which is using it. It's, it's using half of its operation is with DLE and the other half is with evaporation ponds. But other than that, they haven't been really tested commercially. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's, um, that's correct. Let me follow up a tiny bit on that. Um, you know, not all brines are created equal. And it turns out that those brines over in Australia have the just perfect cocktail for the system that they've engineered to work it with. And that is not the same around the world. So the concentrations of lithium and as well as the other ions in that in those brines are different and they change. They change as you produce them. So so all that has to be managed and incorporated into an extractive system. Yeah, what goes, which goes a little bit um, into Elizabeth's paper, very insightful paper about the lack of uh, scientific, enough scientific knowledge of each, uh, each of the brines in uh, Latin America to be able to tell how the lithium extraction affects the, the water movement in each of the brines. I mean, that takes... A lot of time, which I believe is what we don't have in this uh, with this uh, decarbonization process that the whole world is going through. So um, thank you very much for that answer. And uh, let's go to the next um, question. And, and uh, I have a, a few questions from the audience that I think um, that I will try to, to put together. And it's a question for, for, for Henry. Um, as a key enabler of the energy transition, lithium has taken a prominent place in the geopolitical competition between Western countries and China. Uh, your paper explores this issue very, very well. And uh, Latin America is at the center of that competition. And China is already way ahead in Latin America than the West. Uh, in Argentina, for example, there are six projects lithium projects under construction expected to start production in the next couple of years, four out of the six 
have Chinese investments. Uh, in Chile, Chinese car maker BYD recently secured lithium at preferential prices in exchange for building a cathode plant. In Bolivia, four out of six recent bids to develop environmentally friendly lithium extraction technology were won by Chinese companies. So if anything, China's presence in the region is growing in the lithium sector. So my question to you is, how do you foresee the geopolitical competition for lithium unfolding in Latin America in coming years? And um, what could be the possible scenarios? The floor is yours. It's a really interesting um, question and hard to predict. But but what we what we can see already happening is increased tension, right? And this is this is part of um, I guess you could call the deterioration in U.S. Um, China relations. But what we're seeing is a lot of hand wringing um, by by Western uh, politicians uh, and efforts by the U.S. and Europe to to create supply chains that are less reliant on, on, on China. So the political will is now there at the highest levels in the US and European Union to uh, reduce reliance on China. Uh, the problem is it's not something um, the West can achieve overnight. And as you said, China's had uh, quite a head start. Um, and in Latin America, what I think is, is so interesting is that we don't see Latin America signing up to US-led partnerships like the Mineral Security Partnership. Um, and then that shows, I think, to some sense that I think they um, will not want to, to sign up to, to Western initiatives to, to completely cut China out. China is their biggest customer um, for Chile, you know, in terms of copper um, and lithium. And China is still the world's biggest EV market with, with incredible growth, right? And we've just seen the Shanghai Auto Show with some really... Uh, bullish projections coming out out of there about growth of EVs in China. So I don't think they are going to um, uh, give up on China. And, you know, they've signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. It's one of these areas where I think it has been um, quite successful, right, in, in winning over um, uh, cooperation. And, and, you know, we saw the recent visit of, um, you know, Brazil's president to China and then the comments he made, um, which were quite interesting. So, so I do think that the Latin America is a favorable um, place for, for, for Chinese companies. And along with Africa, I think this is where they see future lithium supply coming from uh, this decade. Australia is going to be tr trickier and trickier for Chinese companies to, to invest in. Um, so yes, Latin America and Africa, um, that's where they're going to uh, focus their investments is where they have focused their investments. Um, now, what does it mean for, for the clash with the West? I mean, I do think... Um, you, you know, the, the U.S. Is, is coming to a realization that, yes, the goals of the Inflation Reduction Act are to obviously stimulate a clean energy industry, um, cut reliance on China. But again, this is not something that can happen overnight. We're talking about uh, building whole new industries um, and where the critical vulnerability is, is a sort of processing um, stage. So this, again, is a sort of new industry for, for the West, and it requires a lot of investment, a lot of expertise. So it can't happen uh, quickly. So I think what we're seeing is a rowing back in the US of some of the stringent requirements and the realization that Chinese companies have to be involved um, at some level um, or, or there has to be some involvement. So I think um, I think as that takes hold, um, you know, I think, um, yes, the West would like more Western companies to invest in Argentina and Chile, but they can't force uh, Western companies to invest, right? And we've seen the big mining companies, the big Western mining companies have not made a move into lithium apart from Rio Tinto, right? So they just haven't seen uh, the interest or uh, the appetite to go in. So Western governments just can't force this um, this investment. So I think what we'll see is more joint ventures, actually, probably like like in Argentina, we saw Aramet of France and, and Qingxian of China um, going in. So I think we will see more joint ventures like this. And my prediction is that the Chinese will adjust the equity ownership to make it um, okay for them to supply the US market under the Inflation Reduction Act. That would be my my prediction. So I think we're gonna see more actual, you know, compromise probably than uh, the high level political rhetoric would suggest. Yes, thank you, Henry. And and following up on that, um, on that answer, do you see Africa coming up as 
a competitor to Latin America. There's a lot of talk about lithium uh, being explored in Africa at the moment, and a lot of companies are looking at Africa. What, how, how, how do you see it vis-a-vis -vis Latin America? Yeah, not a competitor. I think we're going to need all the lithium um, that we can get. If you look at, um, and again, you know, the comments coming out of the Shanghai Auto Show were very bullish on Chinese EV penetration. If you look at, um, if, if you wanted to meet all the OEM, the projections of the car companies and, and the policies that are coming out, lithium could be in a deficit for, for, for this decade. Um, you know, that's not our base case. Our base case is it could become more balanced um, in 2025, 26. Um, but if you're looking sort of beyond 2030, when we're, we're going to need a lot more um, lithium or towards the end of this decade. Um, so, you know, all, obviously it depends on how quickly EVs um, grow. But, you know, I think the Chinese market's looking uh, pretty positive. Um, the US with these consumer tax credits coming through now, um, we're going to see more growth. So we need all the lithium um, that we can get. Um, so I don't think uh, competitor is the right way um, uh, to view it. Now, now what is um, what is happening um, is we've seen um, Chilean companies like SQM investing in uh, you know plants in China, processing in China. Um, Albemarle has also done that in in China as well. But what we need what we need to see is building up the rest of the supply chain in uh, the Western Hemisphere, so that the lithium from Chile, Argentina can get redirected into new uh, supply chains. It doesn't have to go um, to China. So that, I think, is um, more of a challenge than actually just expanding um, lithium supply. It's the creation of whole new supply chains and, and each step of these supply chains. Otherwise, you're sending stuff to China, then sending it uh, back again. So that's um, the challenge challenge for the West. And Albemarle said it's going to invest in um, lithium processing um, in the US. But for these companies, you know, they see China as still the biggest EV market. They think in terms of business, right? They've got to make decisions based on where the demand is. So, of course, they're investing in uh, Chinese plants at the same time as this political rhetoric is getting more complicated. Yes. And just uh, to, to quote Elon Musk, who said uh, the other day that refining is the secret, not not the amount of lithium that you have. And in fact, Latin America, both Chile and Argentina, they export refined products. So they already add yes. value to the product at home. So that is a big advantage of the region. Well, thank you very much, Henry, for that uh, comprehensive question. And, and now I'm going to go to uh, John, back to John, well, one of the Johns, I don't know whoever wants to answer this question. Um, Australia is the number one lithium producer in, in the world, but it has not experienced the institutional challenges and local opposition that other countries are witnessing, from Portugal to Serbia to North Carolina to Chile to Argentina, everywhere. Why is lithium mining acceptable in Australia, but not elsewhere? Does it have to do with the fact that lithium is extracted from brines in Latin America, not from rock like in Australia? Uh, are there lessons to be learned for Latin America from Australia or from the experience of other countries uh, like John mentioned before? The floor is yours to whoever of the Johns wants to answer. I'll, I'll, go, for the, I'll go for that one, Patricia. That's a neat, it's a neat thing. And, and uh, I've, I've thought a little bit about that. And you know, Australia is a, is a, a mineral commodity uh, dependent nation, and and they indeed have not witnessed the opposition that we've seen in some other nations, and I think that's fundamentally based on about three things. Um, in Australia, mineral extraction has a long tradition of, uh, of 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 operations that that society has known. They've understood it. They've appreciated. They've appreciated the value that 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 uh, industry has played in their in their nation overall. You know, the green bush. Uh, Greenbush's lithium deposit is 135 years old. It's a it's a it's a it's a pegmatitic system that's been exploited uh, for a long, long time. Uh, it's named after green, uh, uh, Cornwall in England. The Cornwall pit is, is the original pit there, named after the Cornwall tin deposits. And they've been mining there for a long, long time. So the community is used to that and they're dependent on the economic and community benefits of mining in that region and have, have done for generations, not, not just a couple of decades, for generations. Um, secondly, Greenbush is, is, is a good community citizen. Um, they have been that way for a long time. 
Uh, even though now ownership is split between you know, Chinese and Albemarle companies, uh, the, the local management is Australian. Uh, Taliesin is an Australian company and it's a known commodity and they have, they have worked uh, together with the community in a, in a, in a, in a productive relationship for a, for a long time. And thirdly, um, uh, it has to do with geography and geology. Um, I'm a geologist by training, so I, so I know the details on this. And, and it turns out that the Australian lithium production has the advantage of being a relatively clean operation for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the system, it's a, it's a hard rock, uh, pegmatitic, spodumene-based uh, system, where uh, there aren't other metals that are going to get liberated into the environment. A lot of mining has the challenge of uh, acid mine or acid rock drainage where sulfides uh, along with metals get moved into groundwater. There's not that possibility just because they don't, they're not present in that, in that deposit. So that's a, a fortuitous thing relative to the, to the geology. Um, additionally, the geography is, is, is quite fortuitous to mining. It's a, it's a moderate temperate place. It doesn't have the temperature and water extremes as a place like the Atacama or other extreme environments. So coupled all three of these things together have really uh, made it a, 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 a situation where opposition has, has not uh, come forth and it's kind of specialized. Uh, that might be applied also to Canada. We might, we might consider some of these same factors. The geology is similar. Uh, the legacy of, of extraction is similar. So the Canadian uh, deposits uh, will possibly have a, a similar kind of circumstance with local support rather than opposition. Greenfield sites like the Yader uh, place in Serbia or others, it's tough when, you, when, when, when there's not a legacy of mining and, 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 and large multinationals come in and say, hey, we're going to do this like Rio Tinto did, and, and we saw the outcome there. Thank you, John. Very, a very good explanation of a very, a very easy explanation of a very difficult topic. Right. And uh, I'm going to go back to Elizabeth. Uh, we heard from John that uh, Australia doesn't seem to have the same water issues that South America has. So, in in Argentina and Chile, the lithium industries are governed by institutional frameworks that are different rules and regulations that are different from, from one another. And these differences impact water management of the brines in different ways. So I was wondering if you could walk us through the differences in each country and the challenges and how these differences impact water management of the salt flats in each country. Yes, that's a great question. Yes, I think that, well, it, it, the, the instruments, the legal instruments are different uh, in the, dif the legal instruments for allocation of rights of extraction, exploration and, exp uh, and extraction rights are different. In Argentina, there is no specific uh, regime that distinguishes between, uh, between lithium in brines and other minerals. And so they are all subject to the general concession system established under the mining code. It's a mining code that dates from 1886 in its original form that establishes the general system for granting exploration and concessions. And so that means that concessions have been, uh, or exactly like extraction rights have been granted on contiguous allotments. Um, what this implies in terms of water management is that uh, when, when projects became operational within the same water basins, within the same salt lakes, so there will be a, a need for companies to exercise extra care, very judicious management, and to cooperate with other companies that operate in other basins. And of course, there are many challenges as well uh, in the enforcement and monitoring task of, uh, the, of the authorities. Uh, in contrast, in Chile, lithium uh, is exempted from the general concession system. So they are allocated, the, the, the rights, the ex, extraction rights are allocated according to direct uh, contracts uh, entered with Corfo uh, between the two companies that operate uh, in the Salar de Atacama and, and Corfo. They are more specific and they are not based uh, uh, on this uh, standard system of allocation of rights. And so these contracts were renegotiated, as we know, in 2016, 2018. And so that there, there are the, the, the negotiation established uh, some 
uh, some uh, contributions to research and development and to, to communities and, and for, for environmental oversight for CORFO. But uh, beyond the difference, I think that is uh, it's important to understand. I think there are important challenges in both cases that relates to the basic baseline information uh, on water, the water and environmental baselines uh, that are required for good decision making. And, and we need to bear in mind that this information is very costly and it's very costly for, for administrations. So actually, and so that's yeah, that it is a very important area for cooperation. So, uh, so we, we need good information for good decisions. Uh, then another question that has been raised is the question of why the symmetry between the knowledge of the hydrology of the, the salt lakes, the basins held by government governments, a government agencies, and by companies, uh, and that the need of governments to, to, to learn on the dynamics of the soil flats to expand, to expand their knowledge for better regulation and better oversight. And then I, I would just uh, building on this, I, I, I think, I'd, and many also say as well that there is a need for more comprehensive uh, instruments, uh, particularly in the case of Argentina, that include the strategic environmental assessments, evaluation of cumulative impact of multiple projects on the basics, uh, territorial planning, and institutional structures around the, the watershed, around the basin. Uh, so for collaboration. And we start to see uh, initiatives in this direction, but I think this is an area of that we need great institutional innovation as well. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and when you were talking about the asymmetries between mm -hmm. the technical information held by companies versus the that held by mm -hmm. officials, mm -hmm. it's a little bit what happens also in the oil industry. Mm -hmm. um, like we mentioned before, Chile is uh, coming up with a new lithium national lithium strategy. As part of that, they're thinking of creating a national, a state-owned lithium company. Do you think that um, a company like that could be um, a tool for um, for trying to 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 put into practice that transfer of technology so that that asymmetry uh, can be reduced? Do you think that might be a way to go? Yes, I feel that, well, I feel that, that this is a type of issues that are uh, in discussion. Uh, so that uh, so to have an institution that, uh, that stores knowledge, that builds capabilities, builds this type of capabilities that are required for managing. So, so I've been talking about the issues re related to environmental and water issues that are so delicate in the management of the salt lakes. So these are the type of roles that, uh, that uh, a company, the state-owned company and the institutional the institutions, so need to, need, to, uh, need to build on. I think uh, that is a great, um, great scope for innovation. And I, I talk about institutional innovation and and so to have structures for cooperation. And so so probably the question of the, the state on lithium company that is uh, is it is taking its time to 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 disclose the details about it, but but we might uh, anticipate this type of functions and roles uh, as well uh, related to to the dynamics and knowledge of the of the soil flats and these are issues the, the question of asymmetry of information is an issue that is is a debate in Chile and so we could oversee that these are the type of functions that the, this uh, in combination of course with uh, with um, with the environmental water authorities could could could, could have. Yes, very interesting. Thank you very much for that, uh, Elizabeth. Um, I will ask my next question to Henry. Um, countries are becoming more protective in their efforts to make sure they have access to the lithium resources. 
they will need for the energy transition. Some countries are starting to talk about, some, some people are starting to talk about resource nationalism and the lithium industry of the kind that we've seen uh, in the oil industry. And uh, both the US and the EU announced initiatives to develop the lithium value chain at home the Inflation Reduction Act that you mentioned before in the US and the Critical Raw Materials Act in Europe. Similarly, in Latin America, producing countries are also becoming more protective of their lithium industries. We just talked about uh, Chile's national lithium strategy. Mexico also recently announced similar moves. Um, I was wondering if, if you thought that this could lead to fragmentation or cooperation between Latin American and Western countries? We were talking before about, about China. How would that protectionism impact Chinese investments in Latin America? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. I think for China, um, you know, it's it's a threat, right? And, and most Chinese companies love free and open markets um, apart from their home market, right, which they keep quite uh, protectionist. But Generally, they're you know they're victims of more um, uh, more measures, and and they'd rather things were were open. Um, I think for them, they face the threat of these countries moving up the value chain. Um, you know, obviously that threatens China's hold over the industry at home. Uh, what we've seen in Indonesia, probably one of the most successful examples of this, is they banned the export of, of raw nickel and said you've got to come build processing in Indonesia, and this is what Chinese companies have done. Um, Indonesia's got the, the value chain, um, but China's also offshored uh, the environmental impact and, and the pollution um, to Indonesia. Um, but yes, it, it, it can be a successful model. And what we see now is other countries, I guess, try to emulate that um, by using the leverage. They see that they um, their leverage is getting stronger and stronger, right? So they're, they're, they're using it to try and um, get more jobs, um, get more value um, in, in, in the country. And I think we've seen, you know, just Tanzania recently um, takes stakes in, in graphite companies. Um, we've seen the Democratic Republic of Congo also try to get more value add. Um, and now we see um, Chile trying to get um, more of a role for the, for the state in, in, in the lithium industry, right? So that they can get, um, you know, get, get more benefit. Um, so, so I think the challenge, um, the challenge though for the, all these countries is it's very hard to move up the value chain. Because as you said, um, Chile already produces lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide. What's the next um, step? Um, you know, they could produce uh, PCAM or, or precursor, um, but you know, almost all the PCAM productions in, in China um, and you need access to, you know, the other materials, um, to reagents and, and chemicals and, and, and all that. So, is it advantageous to to build more of the supply chain in these countries? I think it's um, it's tricky to say. Um, you probably need um, you know you probably need automakers also um, to be involved, and that's why the the decision by BYD to be involved in in Chile is is really really interesting. And I wonder what their sort of end game is. Um, Chile is a big market for BYD buses, um, uh, uh, obviously, but it'd be it's interesting to see. Um, to see that move because most automakers would rather the supply chain be built out in the major markets right china europe and and north america so that that would make um, um more sense you know areas like quebec um are becoming a cluster um because you know it's logistic you've got logistics you've got hydropower you've got access to the u.s market so um that i can see makes a lot of sense but it, perhaps it makes less sense to to, you know, for Chile to do it or for, for DRC um, or even Australia um, to do it. So the, these are sort of big questions uh, for these countries. Um, Indonesia has been successful because they also are going to be a big EV market, I think, you know, and I think Southeast Asia is going to be a big EV market. So they, I think, are managing to go from nickel to, to batteries and to EVs, um, you know, it seems to be quite, quite successfully. So that's a very interesting model, but I don't know if Chile um, and these other countries will be such big um, and markets. So I think, yes, they're trying to use their leverage. But remember, Chile tried this before, offering discounted lithium, and it didn't work out, did it? I mean, it seems very attractive, um, but it didn't work out before. So um, it'd be interesting to see why BYD is doing this. What's um, what's the sort of thinking uh, behind behind this? Is it a um, you know, you know, a longer term bet um, on, on Chinese investment in Chile? Um, yeah, really interesting to see that see that move. 
And do you see um, someone from the audience is as is, is asking if um, the these initiatives from the the, the IRA and the Critical Minerals Act um, are we starting to see any movement in that direction? Are we starting to see more interest in the region uh, because of those initiatives, or is it too soon to tell? Yeah, I think so. The Inflation Reduction Act is. Um... You know, is is an amazing piece of legislation and offers very generous um, uh, provisions. And of course, it incentivizes um, supply to come from free trade agreement countries. So Chile, uh, being one of those places, obviously it is uh, attractive for for automakers to to get um, lithium supplies for, from uh, from from Chile. Of course, um, of course that that I think is 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 helping um, uh, Chile's uh, position. But at the same time, we see the U.S. now saying. They're going to expand um, FTA countries. They're going to include, um, you know, countries without formal FTAs. But if you know, it, loosening the restrictions, and they've done deals with the EU, they've done deals with Japan. Um, so I, I guess people, you know, what kind of certainty do we have um, that you know this this won't just be loosened um, more and more? Um, I think that that is uh, one of the concern, and that's also causing opposition from mining companies within the US who are like, well, I thought the point of this is to stimulate the US supply chain. Now you're just adding more and more um, eligible countries. So, um, you know, that I think, um, you know, one of the biggest issues I think for the IRA is the long term certainty, right? We've got this election coming up, you know, it looks like Biden uh, and Trump again. Um, you know, I guess China has had uh, quite good policy certainty, but the IRA is great, but can investors feel comfortable that the certainty that is going to last, that these provisions um, are not going to have more uh, flexibility introduced? I think these are all really pertinent um, questions. But for sure, the IRA has had a huge impact in stimulating uh, investment into the US um, supply chain because it is so um, it is so generous. So, yes, that is uh, potentially a huge advantage for, for Chile. Okay, thank you very much, Henry. And now my next question goes to John Graham. Uh, lithium companies seem to have a historic opportunity to show host countries and communities that their business can be a fundamental part of their economic growth. And that is because it is a new industry. It hasn't been contaminated from, from past, a past history of activity. Um, so its performance is yet to be tested. Um, so do you think, uh, unfortunately though, this is, these com companies are facing in trying to do that, they're facing a history of mining practices in these areas that have left scars among the local population. And I was thinking you did a very nice job in, in the paper that you and, and John Rupp wrote about um, when you talked about perceptions in the mining industry and how that um, affects new new developments. And, um, and I was wondering if you could tell us about that and if you could reflect on whether the lithium industry could be a game changer in, in that respect. Could it break those perceptions that communities have? The floor is yours. Well, Patricia, you might think that we're talking about mining and processing lithium for the green energy transition. So you might think that would create an opportunity. But the reality is that the concerns and opposition to lithium mining, they don't arise just from local community and local concerns. They are partly orchestrated by regional, national, and international environmental groups. There are U.S. environmental groups that are very active in Chile. The same groups that favor expansion of electric vehicles are now, are now in Chile training activists on how to oppose the uh, development of lithium money. It's a fascinating irony. Uh, and we have to remember that these environmental groups are complex bureaucracies. Part of their funding comes from foundations interested in climate change, and they'll be very pro-electric vehicle and that sort of thing. But part of their funding comes from from uh, foundations that are primarily interested in preserving and conserving the land and the environment. And these are very hostile to mining operations of all sorts, lithium mining included. So I think what you're going to find is the opposition 
to lithium mining is going to be becoming increasingly sophisticated, good on communications, and able to access sympathetic politicians. That puts tremendous burden on developers to act in this kind of setting. And that's where I think we have to remember that there are places right now that look a lot more comfortable for developers uh, than Latin America. It was 2014, Chile was number one lithium miner in the world. Australia is now number one by a factor of three or four. My, my co-author, John, and I believe Canada is going to emerge as a significant player. Some people feel Arg Argentina might, but I want to remind people that a lot of the same concerns that you're hearing in Chile exist in Argentina, too. It's just the scale of the industry is so much smaller right now in Argentina. As it grows and as the footprint of lithium mining grows in Argentina, it may confront the same kind of water-related concerns that have been so difficult in Chile. So I don't, I'm don't. i not here today as an optimist that Latin America is really going to be able to solve this lithium challenge. I think it's the recent decision by Chile is very unfortunate. I think a better approach, which is being developed by the German auto companies, is to work with the universities in Latin America to develop scientific research teams with universities and industry and to develop the, the science base around the hydrology of the different sites. That can be done, and it's being done all around the world, and I think it can make a big difference. Thank you, John. Um, I see you're not very optimistic on this issue in relation to the lithium industry. Um, someone from the author is asking, and this is a follow-up, um, whether Chile, which has a, a long history of depending on mineral extraction, um, on oil, gas, copper, others, could that be uh, a good learning pad for the lithium industry in this respect? I remember reading uh, some of the materials about the concerns of of local groups in Chile. A lot of them relate to the history of copper mining in Chile. And it was in your original question to me about how the history of these countries with mining and their experience. And it's fascinating. In some areas, the uh, the history is positive. For example, there, there are two projects trying to be developed in North Carolina right now in the United States. One is an area that had a very successful experience with lithium mining decades ago. The other is the community can't even imagine the possibility they would put lithium mining in this community. I mean, it's, it seems so offensive. So I think the history is very complicated and you need to know the culture, the history of the particular community. And what's fascinating is this is what developers need to know. But a lot of these companies, are, they're engineers and scientists. These are not historians and social scientists who study culture. But in many ways, that's the kind of expertise they need in order to figure out where they can actually make a big difference with lithium money. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. And I'm looking <laughs> at the time. We have um, three minutes left. So I will ask a question for all of you to answer. Um, for several decades now, responsible mining practices have been improving. We have higher in industry standards, best practices, early and effective consultation. I mean, in general, generally speaking, not everywhere and always. Still, there continues to be much opposition to mining like we're talking about here today. Projects are delayed, canceled due to that local opposition. My question to you as experts is, could you come up with three or four key recommendations that could ensure the success of the lithium industry and ultimately of the energy transition? Uh, so I'll, we'll, we'll start with Elizabeth and uh, please be mindful of the time. Um, I will give you one minute. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Patricia. Well, in, in my paper, I, I suggested that we need a new water blueprint for the governance of the small flats uh, for lithium uh, extraction among this, uh, in this, in this, uh, uh, to, to, to get to, to, to face these challenges. And this is based, this should be based in strong institutions that are participative, inclusive, and structured as ecosystems of governance and innovation 
uh, they should be based on, on knowledge, on deep scientific knowledge, but also be aware of, 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 of the ways of communities to, to know and to, and to look at the ways they see uh, uh, no, uh, the, the salars as part of their ecosystems. And uh, this, this, this uh, new water blueprint should also be based on multi-level co cooperation and should also be based on, I think, that on be aware of outcomes, uh, just uh, justice, value addition. I think that is important. Uh, so it is, it is a very complex task, but requires new ways of working and collaborating with each other. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Henry, would you like to, to go next? I'll give you 50 seconds. <laughs> I think it's a difficult one to answer, but I would say, I think someone raised the point earlier that the local people uh, get the benefit rather than, you know, what we see money going to the central government and then that you do, doesn't necessarily filter down to, to local areas. I think that would be um, key. I also think innovation, let's just, we need to keep pushing um, innovation um, and, and often the mining companies haven't um, been innovative enough. Um, I think that's important. Um, you know, we have artificial intelligence coming down the track very, very fast now. Um, how can that help us um, innovate? I, I'm looking forward to see how that's um, um, going to work. Um, um, yeah, those are my, I, I don't have, um, yeah, those are my sort of points on that. Good, good. Thank you. And lastly, you have 50 seconds. Uh, the Johns, I don't know how you want to divide up the 50 seconds, but go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, John. Let me jump in with a, with a, with a, a euphemism, a, a concept, and it's going to build upon and hopefully encapsulate some of the things that Elizabeth said. Uh, we have been very good, and I am certainly part of this because I'm a technical guy to the core, a technical and techno-economic characterization of systems. We, we go and we, and we define uh, where ore bodies are and how we can extract them. We need to be much better at social site characterization, a formal and, and collaborative suite of practices that characterizes the, the, the soft aspects, the, the, the societal aspects of a, of a site and, and broad writ, writ large, both the local as well as the contextual aspects of society and woven in and integrated with uh, those technical and economic aspects. Okay, uh, so I think with that, we are um, a minute over our, our time. I thank you all for being here today for producing those extraordinary papers and uh, thank you to the audience. And I, I um, invite them to go to our website and uh, read these fantastic papers and also to stay tuned to the Wilson Center for future flagship lithium reports as this was just the first one of a series. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.